All right, there we go. Hello, everyone. How's it going? Team here, and this is BXJS Weekly episode 36. Uh, at this point, I probably should rename it into the um, React Hooks podcast instead of JavaScript podcast because, well, if you thought we are ended up with hooks last week, uh, you are kind of wrong. We got a lot of stuff related to React Hooks once again. Uh, hey, Mandeputra, welcome to the stream. So uh, this time around, we got a bit of articles and news and some minor announcements and interesting tidbits, uh, just two releases and a whole lot of libraries and demos. As I said, mostly related to JavaScript, uh, sorry, React hooks. And we also have some interesting and silly things at the end. So let's get started. Uh, the first article we got today is called how to handle monetary values in JavaScript. And it talks about exactly that, right? So if you never uh, thought about working with money in JavaScript, or maybe you did, and then you encountered problems, you know that there is a bunch of problems related to number uh, type and the floating point math and all that kind of things. Right, so one of the most you know obvious examples could be the um, addition of uh, 0 0.1 and 0 0.2, which results in 0 0.3, and then a lot of zeros four, right? Because floating point is not uh, there's basically a precision to it, right? And um, this is how it works. So if you work with money, you don't actually want to have this kind of problems. And the article exactly talks what kind of pitfalls are there and how you can work around them and uh, how you can work with the money in JavaScript if you absolutely need to, uh, specifically Dinero.js library, which is actually quite nice. So if you haven't seen it and if you haven't worked with the money or you need to work with the money and you were struggling to figure out how to do that, check this article out. It will uh, guide you through basically all you need to know about that. Although now actually the interesting thing is we now have the big end, right, which should be way better suited to working with money. The question is, did Dinero switch to Biggins? Because that would make a lot of sense, at least in my head. I'm, I'm sure I might not be correct here, but uh, it's an interesting question. Anyway, do check it out. It's quite interesting. Second article we got today is called Using Events in Node.js the Right Way. This is essentially a tutorial for the um, event emitter and event driven architectures, right? So if you already know what event emitters are and how to uh, construct apps around them, how the event driven architecture works, you won't really find anything new here. But uh, if uh, some of those words or maybe all of those words are new to you and you never worked with event driven architectures or you're not entirely sure how to create your own event emitters and how to use them in the apps, then this article is a pretty good tutorial that will walk you through just about all that you have to know to start working with um, events in not just a node, to be honest, because I mean, event emitter class that is used in the tutorial is node specific, yes, but you can also use the same approach in the browser with a separate library for event emitter essentially. So it is quite good. If you are interested in that, do check it out. It's definitely worth it. Next article we got today is uh, called Growing Pains, Migrating Slack's Desktop App to Browser View. This is a write up from the uh, engineering team at Slack uh, on how they actually updated their Electron app from the very, very old web view which was uh, used in the Electron, hell if I remember, like on one of the first versions basically, right? To the newer um, browser view, which is way more performant and has a better sort of isolation and better feature, like not better features, but different feature set, right? It's different implementation essentially. And um, so the, the story is basically how they migrated, why they migrated, what kind of problems they encountered, and a bit more information on how the, exactly the Slack desktop app is structured, what libraries do they use, and uh, what kind of challenges uh, they face during that migration. So if that sounds interesting to you, do check it out. There is a bit of code here and there. Nothing too uh, technical, or rather not, I mean, it is very technical, but nothing, there's not not that much specific code is what I want to say. But there is a lot of uh, very deep insights into the complex Electron apps, let's put it this way. Uh, it's worth noting that Slack app is still probably not the best Electron app out there. Let's just put it that way mildly. Um, if like, I don't like, I don't know, I haven't, I use it daily, but it's still, I think, one of the worst Electron apps that I've had to use. And in comparison to something like VS Code or 
even Discord, that is also like a chat client essentially, right? It's just, I like, I still don't understand how they managed to make it so freaking slow and so freaking resource intensive. <laughs> Nonetheless, a very interesting write-up and definitely worth reading if you are working with Electron and related technologies. All right, next article we got is called Generic Hooks, which is actually a total lie about the... Uh, what the article is about and uh, the subtitle actually summarizes this way better it's called why observable plus syntactic sugar is the answer tm maybe so um i find this article and the proposal absolutely fascinating because uh, if you followed me even a bit you know that i'm a quite a big fan of observables and specifically rxjs right there's already been a proposal um to bringing observables into JavaScript core, right, as a native uh, language feature. And uh, this proposal takes it a step further. I don't think it's formalized yet because I didn't find any links to the like formal spec or anything like this, but the idea is really cool. So um, the article basically why it talks, why, why the, why the uh, title is generic hooks is because the article starts with saying, hey, okay, so we now have those React hooks, right? And what they do actually is they allow you to monitor and update on changes of uh, state, which is exactly what observables do, right? Uh, so it, it then uh, further uh, expands on how you use observables at the current moment uh, to render something, right? So you cannot just render observable, you, it will fail because it's gonna be observable object. You actually need to map it to locale time string, for example, right? So you need to map the value from observable and then render that value. And uh, typically to do that, you have to subscribe, for example, right? And it's not very convenient when it comes down to rendering and in the DOM, for example, right? Not as convenient as React. So the author proposes observe syntax, which would allow you to observe the observable and then do something to it, similar to how you could await a promise, right? And this is essentially the proposal, right? So the proposal is that we can observe the observable and then the code will auto update and we have the observable function, which is again, similar to a sync of eight. And I find this absolutely awesome. Uh, hey, P. Dillinger, welcome to the stream. Uh, so yeah, this is sort of the thing in a nutshell. Again, I have not found a formal GitHub repo or anything like this for formal spec, but I personally find this syntax to be awesome. Like if we could do that, it would open so many possibilities to writing code like 20 times simpler because Observables are very power powerful abstraction, right? Especially when you need to observe changes. And this this stuff simplifies code like tenfold when you need to render those changes. So um, the author here implemented the Babel plugin that basically allows you to uh, write code like this. Once again, it's you know a sort of experimental thing, but it does look pretty amazing. So if you are interested in RxJS observables, do check this out because it is a very interesting proposal. And I am curious if it will go, like if it will progress further, right? Because we do have, again, as I already said, we do have the JavaScript native observables proposal, which I don't even know what stage it is in JS observable proposal. So I remember it was being submitted and was being even championed by one of the um, RxJS guys, right? Hey, Bakao, welcome to the stream. So let's have a look here really quickly because I am curious, is there a stage running tests? Stage, do we have stage in here? No, we don't. Uh, I mean, it is in TC39 repo or group. So that means that it's far enough. Stage one, okay, so it's stage one, uh, which is actually quite a, quite a lot of progress. Last time I saw it, it was like stage zero and still under discussion. So it's really cool to see it progress. But anyway, really cool article, really interesting proposal. And uh, yeah, making JavaScript more reactive would definitely be quite amazing. All right, continuing, we got the optimistic UI with React. Um, demonstration introduction to the optimistic UI approach uh, with specifically React apps and GraphQL Apollo. Um, and I, again, you know, the pattern of optimistic UI is not React specific. And if you've never heard about it, uh, do check it out. It's really cool. The idea essentially that instead of, you know, when you click item, instead of showing some loading states and then showing the result, 
you actually show the result immediately and then somehow update the result once the request is finished. Like this uh, here in the screen, you can see the to-do list. And in the typical to-do list, you would have like saving button that is just currently showing you, hey, I'm saving. And then you would get the item in the to-do list once it's done. And the optimistic to-do list on the other hand shows the item immediately, but it shows it grayed out. And once the request goes through, the item becomes you know fully rendered basically. I think it's a really cool approach and uh, it makes the UI way snappier and it feels a lot faster, even though you know you don't have any loaders or anything like this. So yeah, then there's basically an example code on how to implement this using React and GraphQL. So check it out if that sounds interesting. I, again, I'm quite a huge fan of, of this approach, but I keep constantly forgetting that this thing exists. So I probably should use it more frequently. <laughs> All right, next thing we got is stealing Chrome cookies without a password. A very interesting um, idea. I mean, article itself, uh, it, well written and everything, but the, the, the core idea of it is that basically, uh, if someone compromises your computer, right, they can actually steal the cookies from your Chrome browser without you even knowing about that and not just, you know, somehow decrypting the storage or doing something like this but actually just running it in a headless mode with your profile, because you can specify the profile here, right? Enabling remote debugging and then just grabbing the cookies from there, directly dumping it and maybe even doing something else with your browser, right? Because they, they have the remote access to it. So um, there is a bunch of technical details in the article and additional discussion which talks about how you can actually prevent that. Well, starting with, you know, not do not let anyone execute code on your computer, which is a solid, solid advice that you should probably follow. And as usual, you know, if, you, if your computer is compromised, then you are likely um, screwed anyway, but hey, Right, uh, so there's apparently there's a channel binding cookies uh, proposal, which sounds very interesting and um, allows you to channel bound cookies and verify them uh, using specific token binding key. So that when you run the Chrome in a different instance that, that the headless instance won't actually be able to do this token binding verification, right? which is quite interesting, but the feature is apparently very experimental, is still disabled by default in Chrome, for example, and there is a heated discussion in the threads uh, on Google Groups. And obviously there's stuff like a yeah, detection of hijacked cookies from the provider side as an on server, you know, if someone uses the same cookie but from other OS, IP, whatever, then it might be the wrong person. And I think majority of vendors actually already do that. Nonetheless, a very interesting article, very interesting um, sort of, angle on all of that on uh, like on one hand, you know, we have those headless Firefox, headless Chrome, and it's amazing that you can now actually do things like do testing end to end testing in them, you know, just basically using a simple remote control protocol. On the other hand, this is definitely an attack vector. And if there's going to be some sort of malicious code, it can do quite a lot. It doesn't even need to hijack your cookies. Just think about that. It can actually act on your behalf, right? And that is kind of terrifying when you think about it. So I'm quite curious to see where this channel bound cookies will develop and if they will get shipped or maybe someone will come up with a better solution. Anyway, next article we got is a Netflix web performance case study uh, from uh, Mr. Adi Osmani, who's always uh, delivers a really high quality articles. Uh, let me have a look. People use Selenium more in Chrome headless. Um, I mean, Selenium is a very old technology, right? So I think um, like the, the, the upside of Selenium is that you can actually use it with pretty much all the existing browsers. The downside is that it's quite slow and cumbersome. Um, the upside again is that we now have headless Chrome and we now have headless Firefox. And there is uh, tools like um, Cypress, for example, that allow you to work with them directly instead of just, you know, relying on Selenium that takes ages to start up. So I, I think Selenium would probably still going to be used more for now, but that's going to change in the next years. At least that's, that's my perception of it. But again, okay, coming back to the Netflix web performance case study. This is a deep dive into the changes in the Netflix website, as in the front end. So specifically talking about the front end code, what did they do to decrease time to interact and loading? And what did they do to re reduce the bundle size, prefetching and all that kind of stuff. So what techniques did they use to improve their website? 
The uh, most interesting thing, I think, and I, I don't remember if we already talked about that, but that's been floating around for quite some time, is that they, the, um, the next year, oh, sorry, the Netflix is written in React, right? But uh, the interesting thing is that they actually don't use React in the client side. So they render the website in the backend using React. They send the rendered page to the user and then they only add a tiny vanilla JavaScript that is that basically makes the page interactive, which is absolutely fascinating. And I have no idea how complex it is to actually do something like that. But apparently that allowed them to reduce the bundle size by 200 kilobytes, which is kind of crazy. Um, right, yeah, so there's a bit more technical details in here, but this is generally the summary of uh, what happened. There's some comparison of how they went from essentially 600 kilobyte bundle to something like 100, um, a bit less even, I think. And um, yeah, prefetching was a pretty huge for them as well, because I, I guess, you know, with the service of size of Netflix, you can actually use things like guest.js to predict where the user will click to prefetch even more efficiently, which is also quite cool. They also compare the prefetching techniques like, you know, using the uh, existing link prefetching, uh, which is not completely supported everywhere and using XHR prefetching, which is essentially manually doing that. So it's uh, quite interesting. And if you are interested in sort of hardcore, uh, low level, let's put it this way, website optimizations for on large scale, do check it out It's a very interesting case study. Next article we got is functional JavaScript, functors, monads and promises. This is very like, okay, let, let me just put it this way. This is, um, I don't even know which number, try number X to explain what the monad is, right? And is promise a monad. And um, if you already know what monads are, if you already know what functors are, if you know if the promise is a monad, then you won't really find anything new in here. If you are trying to learn functional programming and you want to know what the monads are, you want to finally figure that out. You want to know what the functors are and how they, you know, how the monads and functors correlate. Then this article actually does a decent job at explaining those concepts and also talks about, you know, hey, we actually have a promise that is kind of like a monad, but not exactly. So if you're interested in functional programming and if you are interested in the theory of functional programming, then uh, do check this article out. It does a pretty good job of explaining functors, monads, and uh, talking about specifically promises as monads and why they are slightly different from the classical monad. Let's put it this way. This is probably entirely wrong, but I am not very good with the functional programming theory. Let me just put it this way, <laughs> or at least the uh, naming in the functional programming theory, because yeah, it's 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 tough. <laughs> All right. Next article we got is called JSX is a stellar invention even with React out of picture and it is delivered to you by people working at PayPal. So if you didn't know JSX is not unique to React, right? So JSX allows you to write this kind of XML like syntax essentially which then translates to function calls. So if you were not aware of that, that actually all of that is gonna be compiled to functions, right? So if you look at the React, that will actually be converted to React create element. And this is how the code from above will actually look. Now, the cool thing is that JSX allows you to change the function that is gonna be used to replace those elements, right? So by default, it's create react element, uh, sorry, react create elements the other way around. But using the JSX pragma comment, you can specify any function, which means that you can take the JSX compiler and do crazy things with it. And this is exactly what the um, PayPal guys did. So they wrote this Kraken, uh, sorry, JSX pragmatic library, which allows you to build JSX structures and then decide at runtime what pragma you want to use to render them. So it makes it even, even more flexible essentially which is kind of crazy when you think about that, but um, seems to be working quite well. So if you are interested in sort of low level details about the JSX and crazy um, related JSX implementations, do check this out. It is a very interesting uh, experiment and I kind of could be interested or would be interested to see more of where they actually use that because, you know, I can imagine a couple of use cases, but uh, the article doesn't really mention anything specific. Anyway, interesting one. 
Right, next thing we got is global state management with React hooks. Yes, we got more React hooks. And this is the article that I actually stumbled upon when I was figuring out if I could do an easier state management using hooks. And I came up with a really cool idea. And I was like, let me search if someone already did that. And turns out, yes, I was not the first one. So uh, we're going to have a look at the library that the author built uh, when we come to the demos and library section. But for now, here's the idea. You can actually use a hook like use state, right? But um, you can use a hook that would allow you to access global state, like some shared state, right? And it will work just as a state hook. Uh, yes, I did name my library just react store hook, which is super stupid. And I don't even know if it's going to survive because I've seen a bunch more implementations of that. And I'm guessing my idea was is probably not going to be the best one or maybe not even the polished one. But we're going to see how that develops. Anyway, coming back to the article. So it walks you through how to create such a use store hook that will give you the store and will give you the update function that basically mimics the use state hook uh, from the react itself, where you can, uh, you know, directly actually um, access it from any component, which is very convenient. And you can write something like this in literally 20 lines of code, I tweeted about that. So if that sounds interesting, do check it out. If you just want the library, we're going to talk about that in the library section. Okay, next article we got is called How to Set Up GraphQL Server Using Node.js, Express, and MongoDB. Very basic tutorial on getting started essentially with GraphQL, Express, and MongoDB. Nothing super fancy here. So if you already know about that, if you already tried that, you won't find anything new here. If you were, you know, if you wanted to get into the GraphQL and Express uh, and Mongo stack, then this is a pretty good tutorial that will walk you through just about all the steps that you uh, need to do to get this working a basic schema setup and so on and so forth. So it's quite nice, basically do check it out. Next article we got is called beyond console log. And uh, no, it's not talking about debugger, it actually talks about more console methods. And uh, well, let's 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 face it, we all know we're all going to end up debugging everything with console log anyway. So why not use other console methods that are actually quite handy. So if you already know about all the console methods and use them all the time, then you won't really find anything new here. Uh, if not, then methods like console dear, console table, console warn, console assert, and so on and so forth are here and uh, explained and displayed basically on, you know, exemplified how you can use them and what they actually do. So if you wanted to learn a bit more about using the console object and not just console logging everything, then this is a pretty good article. Um, I mean, if you're using debugger, then you probably don't need that. <laughs> All right. Next article is we got is called bending Jstar wheel caching modules across tests. This is a um, very interesting article that basically yes, bending jest to our wheel is a very good title because they literally figure out how the jest works and then hack it to work in the way the author wants, which is something that you don't actually want to do. Because typically, that means that your tests are not, not so well, or not even tests, maybe your even your code is not so well written, right. And the author in the end of the article, actually admits that and says, like, in hindsight, I should have go, I should go have a talk with my team, because you know, this is not, this is not correct usage of the jest. This is actually not you should what you should be doing. But it is interesting that there is a way to essentially provide a shared um, module, right? So the, if you did know jest ignores require cache. So every time you run a test is going to be a clean state, right? So for example, you have a database connection every time you run a test that will require a module with database connection, this database connection will be established again. So there's not going to be any caching any sharing or anything like that. And in this case, author will like, okay, so we are gonna, we want one shared connection, how can we do this? And uh, yeah, it is quite a way around. So they use the mocking and then they use globals uh, through the environment to give the shared module, which is kind of insane when you think about it, but apparently it works. So it's an interesting exercise in breaking or I guess not breaking but hacking jest, but uh, something that you should likely not do in in your code, you know, if you if you have to go to this extent to test your code, then maybe you should just rewrite the code to be a bit more testable. But yeah, there you go. 
Okay, um, next thing we got is called Goodbye Electron Hello Desktop Progressive Web Apps. And it's essentially an overview of the Chrome 70s uh, Progressive Web App feature that allows you to install Progressive Web Apps onto desktop. If you did know this, I believe it is actually disabled by default right now on, oh yeah, okay. So it's not, it's not enabled by default on uh, Mac OS yet. It is enabled by default on all other platforms. So the thing is, is that you can open any web app that is a progressive app, like for example, experimental progressive web app or Twitter or Starbucks or Google Maps. And you will get a prompt that will say, hey, do you actually wanna install this app onto your computer, right? Just the same way the progressive web apps works on our phones. You can actually have a dedicated um, link to it. It's gonna be like a shortcut or the, uh, what do you call it? The icon is what I'm trying to say, right? And if you click this icon, it will open in a separate window and will be completely isolated from everything else you do in a browser, which is very nice and very convenient. And um, the author here basically shows that off and talks about that in the long run, the progressive web apps might replace Electron completely. And some of them even already started working towards that because they don't really use all the things that Electron provides. I think that the... Uh, while this is true and there's a lot of progressive web apps that might migrate off the Electron, there are some that might not be, uh, like it might just not be viable, right? Because they might depend on the Node.js part of Electron a bit too much. But anyway, it's a quite good introduction to the progressive web apps in Chrome. So if you never heard about them, do check it out. It is quite cool. Okay, last thing we got today is this video. It is um, from the JS EU that just happened in October. And it is from Philip Roberts and it's called What the Heck is Event Loop Anyway? And it's a really, really cool video that talks about how does event loop in JavaScript works. So if you've been coding JavaScript and if you kind of know what the event loop is, but not completely sure, you know, there's like the call stack, the heap and all those strange terms that you kinda a bit understand, but not entirely, just watch this video. This is possibly the best explanation I've ever heard and seen about the whole JavaScript event loop and all the related technologies, you know, just watch it basically. And I think even, even um, after all these years, I was able to pick up a few things that I didn't quite understand about the event loop in this specific video. So it's really, really good, highly recommend it. Okay, that is it for the articles. Now we got a bunch of uh, tiny, interesting things. So the first one is that um, the guys at Facebook actually formed the GraphQL Foundation. So there is gonna be a GraphQL Foundation and it's gonna handle the GraphQL um, development process essentially. They're gonna have RFC process, they're gonna have working groups and all the things that are basically related to having a foundation. And um, it's kind of interesting to see where all of that will go, but uh, yeah, pretty cool nonetheless. Next thing we got here is the comparison uh, of the latest Node.js with Rust server. And I think in the comments, someone throw in a Golang server or not. No, I'm confusing. Okay, so it's just Rust versus Node.js. Here's an interesting thing. While Rust is obviously faster, right? Because it's a very low level thing is basically on par with C, C++ servers. Node.js actually doesn't lose that much. So we got Rust over here uh, running at 50,000 requests per second, when Node.js in a single mode runs at, well, 39,000 requests, almost 40,000. And if you turn on the cluster, it's gonna run at 67,000 requests per second. This is obviously just for the basic Hello World app. So as soon as you start adding logic, the Rust is gonna remain more or less the same, right? Because it's very efficient and Node.js is gonna start slugging. But nonetheless, the idea that the core HTTP server in Rust and in Node.js are so close to each other is kind of insane. And um, yeah, it's just, it's just a bit mind blowing that Node is, can be that efficient with serving requests essentially, even, you know, even the simple ones. Okay, next thing we got here is no more snapshots folders with Jest, a tiny uh, thing that basically in Jest24 actually allows you to configure where the snapshots are gonna be stored. I personally actually like having the snapshots folder because I can just you know look at the snapshots and know if 
if the snapshots are correct, because I never trust um, <laughs> anything I do basically. So I have to verify everything. But uh, if you for some reason want to move snapshots to a different f folder or maybe, you know, localize them in a specific subfolder of your project, then now you can actually do that with a snapshot resolver field. And this is a tiny tutorial on how to do that. Pretty neat. Next thing we got is this uh, tip uh, from uh, Sagif who says that apparently a lot of people don't know that you can call react dot, uh, react dom dot render multiple times and it will mount uh, separate applications into separate nodes. So if you did not know he, that there is a link here that actually demonstrates how to do that and that you can actually render more than one react app into the window by uh, calling react dom dot render multiple times, which is kind of useful. Okay, next thing we got here is a Tink FAQ, a package and binder for JavaScript. If you um, never heard of it, or don't know, or maybe forgot, Tink is the uh, NPM successor, right, that is still in development and highly experimental. And it's supposed to replace NPM at some point uh, by, uh, so basically, the core difference is that instead of installing everything into node modules locally, it actually uses the global cache and then resolves the modules for the app, which is kind of awesome. And Tink is the NPM's version of this. And then the Yarn have the Yarn PNP uh, that is already shipped actually, that is the Yarn version of that, right? This is a bit more detailed FAQ that talks and answers about the common questions on that stuff and what kind of languages it support, how does it work, when it's gonna, like, how does it work with NPM, is gonna replace it and so on and so forth. So if you're interested, do check it out. Next thing we got here is writing quality vulnerability reports from the NPM blog. And <clears throat> essentially, it's a tutorial that walks you through how to properly report a vulnerability on NPM, because apparently some people don't quite provide enough details. So I guess they got tired of that and wrote a nice tutorial. So if, if you ever need a guide on how to report the vulnerability, then you have it over here. And it's, uh, I mean, it's, it's quite short, but you know, quite detailed. Next thing we got here is what's new to LTS with Node 10 LTS. So this is an overview of the new things that are coming to Node LTS with a Node 10 release. We had the LTS release last week. Essentially an overview of what the people upgrading from Node 8 to Node 10 get, which is the new version of OpenSSL, Node.js CLI auto completion, recursive make dear and make dear sync, PEM level encryption support, and all other things like this, right? So if you are still living on node eight and thinking about upgrading, and you don't know what you are actually going to be getting, this is a very nice summary. Next article we got is called use ad blocking in your dev environment, be careful how you name those divs. And um, I think this is the advice that everyone who writes any front end should follow because well, turns out the ad blocking does not just blocks things that contain ad in them, right? So this is the most obvious example. But uh, hey, if you actually call it if, if your um, IDs or classes have the thing, uh, the letters MPU in them, then it's gonna be blocked as well because apparently there's the thing called mid page unit and it's also ads and it's commonly trimmed. And there's as well a bunch of other things like GDB, rec, title, footer. And uh, yeah, it's like, it's kind of insane how many commonly named, uh, bleh, commonly named things the ads have. So, if you're developing front end, please install adblock, enable it and test your website with it to actually make sure that everything you want to show to the user will appear and you know, it, it, like it's not disappearing magically. <laughs> okay, next thing we got here is not exactly JavaScript, but I just thought it's really nice. So I would share it. It's called git aliases I can't live without. And just a small note, the author here actually uses the aliases in his shell. So instead of aliasing git uh, commands, he aliases the whole git command, sub commands in the shell, like GCL is gonna be git clone, GF gonna be git fetch. I personally prefer smaller git aliases. So I usually do like git co, like yeah, git co, git st and so on and so forth. But nonetheless, I have pretty much I think almost all of those aliases that the author uses, which is very handy. And uh, have a look, maybe you'll find the ones that you like as well, because it's always a bit annoying to try to remember all of those things or, you know, write them, for example, 
For example, yeah, there is the git stash, which is incredibly useful for commands, but there is git stash pop, which I keep forgetting because I am an idiot apparently. And I just created git unstash command for myself because that just sits easier with me, you know, and I can easily remember it. But yeah, check it out. Maybe you'll pick up a couple of nice um, aliases. There is also interesting notes in the comments. Be sure to read them. There's some additional uh, neat things in there. Okay, next thing we got gear, and I think this is the last uh, tiny thing for today is the React Native open source roadmap. So they shared the roadmap for the development in the nearest future. So if you're interested in React Native and you are working with it or tracking it, do check it out. You will basically know about everything that they are working on, which is kind of neat. All right, now releases section. We only got actually two this week around. I, for some reason, didn't see anything else that was updated recently, but um, there you go. So the major release being Prettier version 115, which is adding HTML, Vue, Angular, and MDX support. Personally, HTML support is kind of awesome and I've been waiting for that for a long time. Um, everything else, yeah, you can just read through. I mean, there's a really large change list as usual. This Man, this, <laughs> this update notes are insane. But yeah, I mean, Prettier is amazing and I won't stop shitting for it. Uh, Git Town. I never heard about Git Town, so let me have a look. So the question from chat is, what do I think about Git Town? Generic high-level Git uh, workflow support. Uh, Git Town hack, Git Town sync. I never heard about that. <laughs> I never knew that existed. It seems like git aliases actually. Um, town alias, town. I I have to. I would have to look at this because I don't know what is this. Supports git flow. So it seems like it's it's one and another one of those like git flow things. I know git flow and I work with git flow. It's okay. Like I'm you know, I personally prefer to do majority of those things manually. But I guess if you have to do them a lot, then maybe it's it's okay. But you know, if I, I, I personally prefer, you know, if I see that I have to do something over and over again, I typically just automate it like with CI or something. That's why I guess I am fine with using few commands that Git provides instead of using a don'ts. I do use Git extras uh, package that is really convenient that provides you a bunch of commands that you can use locally to, um, well, this is the video, we don't want that that uh, allow you to do things like git ignore that automatically pushes things into ignore file or git uh, release that automatically tags and pushes everything to the remote. So, you know, this is sort of the more fine grained commands is what I prefer. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it looks like it's a git flow tool. So it's, yeah, it's fine. Uh, it's nice to share a git workflow I can compare it to mine. I mean, my git workflow is very simple. I typically have, uh, master branch, which is the current release branch, right? If you take ExoFrame as example. So you have the master branch, which is the latest version that is currently released. It is typically tagged. So you have the tags for releases and then you have the develop branch and then hotfixes branch. So it's, it's essentially Git flow, right? But I just manage it either manually or through CI. So that, that's basically the whole difference. I don't usually do it locally that much. So for example, for releases workflow, I have the CI set up as soon as I push the tag, it will automatically release and merge everything that I need to. Um, there you go. Okay, continuing the next release and the last release we got today is Workbox version four is now beta. It uh, comes with advanced background sync features, pre-caching uh, um, errors on 400 and 500 responses and some developer experience improvements. Never heard of Workbox. It's a very nice tool for, why is it mobile? That's a good question. Uh, it's a very nice tool for progressive web apps and it essentially automatically scaffolds like service workers and stuff like this for you. So quite convenient and really cool to see a new version of it essentially. So version four is gonna be next major update and it's likely coming uh, quite soon. Okay. Now we are coming to libraries and demos. And yes, as you might've guessed this time around, we also have a lot of React hooks things. And the first thing I wanna highlight, which is actually quite incredible, someone uh, built a pony fill for React hooks. So you can actually use React hooks with a current version of React. Works in a very simple way. You have the higher order component with hooks. And then after that, you can just write your function as if you would write the React hooks, which is kind of, awesome, right? And okay, the other caveat is that you actually have to get the hooks from the 
React with hooks package instead of React itself. I imagine using that, you would be able to easily then rewrite your code to the actual hooks once they are shipped. So, you know, if you're eager to use it right now in your app and you want it immediately, do check it out. This seems to be pretty cool. Next demo we got is called hooks.guide. And it's a collection of React hooks curated by the community. There is a lot of them. And essentially they, you know, there's a, most of them are pretty small uh, hooks that are uh, come with the source code so you can actually just see how they work. Obviously there's some examples for built-in ones, but uh, yeah, implementations for like use Boolean or use hover or whatever. You got a tiny implementation and then the example and a demo that shows you how they work. So pretty convenient. Although, you know, I would probably prefer all of that to be also released as a library, not just a website because copy pasting code is not that nice. All right. The next thing we got is usehooks.com, a website that uh, posts the daily, like the one hook recipe a day, essentially. Also, again, the same problem, like one hand, it's really cool to learn hooks. On the other hand, I, you know, copy pasting code is not that nice. So I would prefer to have that as a library. It's likely gonna end up being a library at some point, but uh, there you go. Next uh, thing we got is called React Use, and it's a bunch of React hooks as a library, which is exactly what I'm talking about. And it has stuff like sensors, uh, UI, animations access, side effects access, life cycles access, state access, and uh, all of them seems to be quite nice. Some of them have demos, although not all of them. And uh, yeah, you can, I mean, hooks are incredible technology and I'm kind of amazed at the velocity the community is moving with them. Okay, next thing we got is the React Hook Store, exactly the state management library that have been shown off in the article we've talked about earlier. And uh, this is the library itself, right? So you download it, you create the store, and then you can use it anywhere with a use store hook. So my, my gripe with it was that, first of all, uh, there is no way, I don't remember if there's actually, yeah, so you can create named stores, but then you have to use this magic string that basically references this store, right? So this is a bit like, yeah, a bit iffy to me at least. So I, I prefer more explicit ways of doing it. This is why I wrote my own approach or so less like, it's very similar to actually what that library did. Uh, but it's sort of a mix between hooks, that library and uh, unstated, right? So the idea here is first of all, you have this container that you can extend, which is very similar to unstated, that has state and can have methods. And from that container, you create your store, which you can then use with a hook anywhere, right? And then you get the state and set state methods, which works in, this, in the way that you expect them to. The difference is, first of all, you have to explicitly provide the store. And uh, second of all, basically you get the store back as a third element. This is useful because you can wrap your code in a provider that will provide the store to all the components down the tree, right? This is then you can just say use store and you will get the state set state and the store itself if you need it for some reason. I'm not sure how that will develop. Again, I think there's already, uh, if we take unstated, for example, there already has been a pull request that introduces hooks. Although, you know, there's been like 14 days and there's doesn't seem to be like there's any discussion or anything like that. I'm gonna see how that ends up. But um, I think using hooks for state management has a pretty big future and I'm pretty sure someone was gonna come up with a better idea than mine for that, but uh, there you go. It's a pretty cool exercise nonetheless. All right, next thing we got here is raw act or a raw act, I guess maybe. Uh, it's a proof of concept from uh, Sokra, who is one of the Webpack developers and creators. And it's a Babel plugin that compiles React components into native DOM instructions and eliminates the need to, react to have in React library at runtime. So essentially you can take your React code and compile it to plain JavaScript. This is what it means. And it reduces the size of the bundle from 126 kilobytes to 20, which is freaking insane. Again, this is proof of concept. It is not ready for production obviously, but it is amazing. And there's been a ton of interest uh, for it. And it's kind of interesting to see how that will develops. 
Send your hooks library to the Twitter on uh, why Ben Lash, although it doesn't have any uh, observables. I mean, if I would add observable in there, it would be pretty cool, but I don't think he would be interested in it without observables. But okay, um, next thing we got here is J he likes hooks. I think he likes hooks primarily because there's like a lot of hooks with observables, but um, I'm, we'll see how that, okay, you know what? <laughs> we'll see how that develops. Feel free to send him a library. I'm, I'm, I don't think that's, I don't know. I, I always feel bad when I'm trying to shill my own stuff, you know? <laughs> Let me just put it this way. <laughs> okay, so the next thing we got here is called JSBI and um, it's from Google Chrome Labs, guys. And it's a pure JavaScript implementation of official big int proposal, which is insane. So you can take this library and use the big ints in the browsers that don't support them, which is like, holy crap, that actually works. And it, it works in an older browsers. I think it even supports Internet Explorer, which is freaking insane. I think I've read about that, like, let me just make sure that I'm not lying. Yeah, 11, internet, no, internet, yeah, come on, internet. I, I, I think I've read somewhere that it supports Internet Explorer because it like, it's just crazy. It's big ints implemented in pure JavaScript that you can use in all browsers. So basically, yes, just have a look. Okay, next thing we got is Redis Stream Aggregator. So uh, Redis 5 shipped with streams that you can now use to publish and subscribe th to things, right? And this library essentially abstracts all of the work that you need to do for you. And you get a nice abstraction when you just create this streams thing and you can then subscribe to a specific ID and then add the data not sure why method is subscribe and then it's add instead of a publish, but essentially it's a pops up library for uh, based on Redis, which seems to be quite nice. So if you are looking for something like this, do check it out, seems to be pretty cool. Next thing we got here is called store, uh, JSON database power, uh, sorry, JSON database with the power of HTTP requests, which essentially means it's an HTTP interface for or REST interface for the MongoDB with a client side library as well. So if you are looking for something like this, do check it out. Worth noting, the documentation is slightly lacking. So do not expect to have a lot of explanation of how exactly everything works, but it actually seems to be quite nice. But um, yeah, I would definitely, could definitely use a lot more documentation. Okay. Next library we got is called Simple Bar, custom vanilla JavaScript library uh, with native scroll, done simple, lightweight, easy to use, and cross browser. Essentially allows you to implement custom scroll bars that looked pretty nice and uh, done in a very nice way. And uh, also, yes, yeah, supported everywhere, even Internet Explorer 9, which is at this stage quite insane, to be honest. I don't think I ever want to touch EA9 anymore. <laughs> but uh, there you go. So if you were looking for a custom scroll bars JavaScript library, then check it out. Next thing we got is called Redbird and it's a modern reverse proxy for Node. So this is a purely Node written, JavaScript written reverse proxy that supports cluster, HTTP2, Let's Encrypt and Docker out of the box and is very easy to install and use. Literally npm install and then you can uh, write a basic script with it and proxy everything, right? And um, yeah, very easy to set up with let's encrypt you literally just I think there's some flag that you pass in there and that's basically done. And uh, yes, it's basically traffic in JavaScript exactly with a programmatic API instead of you know, traffic is more of a customer facing thing where you have like the config and everything and this is more of a code driven thing. So this is the difference. Pros versus traffic, I don't think at least in this Point. I mean, traffic has been on the market for a very long time and it has a very, uh, like it's been developed for longer. So it has a lot more features and a lot more uh, backbone to it, right? And it's probably gonna be faster because it's written in Golang as well. So if you need fast and simple proxy that you wanna set up in seconds, then Redbird is obviously gonna be a better choice. Let's just put it this way. So simplicity is gonna be the pros, right? Okay. Next thing we got here is called React Wait, and it's a complex loader management hook for React application that allows you to exactly do the complex load management uh, using React hooks once again. So uh, the idea is that you can use wait hook, call the use wait hook, which gives you a bunch of abstractions, like for example, is waiting or 
uh, start waiting or end waiting, right? And you can check for waiting in other components that start waiting using magic strings, which again is a bit iffy, but you know, I don't think there might be even a better solution for that. But yeah, so if you wanted a distributed weight management using React hooks, do check it out. Uh, it's kind of amusing that they don't have a huge warning that React hooks are not final and experimental. And so yes, you are warned, this thing is experimental, do not use it in production. Okay, next thing we got here is Enquirer with E in the beginning. It's a stylish, intuitive and user-friendly prompt system. It's just like Inquirer with I in the beginning, but with E in the beginning, and it seems to be more modern and faster version um, of Inquirer essentially, right? It seems to have more or less all the same features, uh, but it only supports Node.js version 8.6 or higher. And um, the thing that was interesting for me is that it actually is about 200 times faster and loading. So it only takes four milliseconds for Enquirer to load as opposed to 286 milliseconds for Inquirer to load, which is kind of damn impressive. So I think I'm gonna be switching the um, exoframe from Inquirer to Enquirer at some point after the basic testing, uh, because this seems to be quite amazing. All right, next uh, thing we got here is Photo P. I, I guess it's Photo P or Photo Pea maybe. I guess it's Photo P, right? Because like it is a P, as in the, the green peas and stuff. Yes, exactly. I guess it's, okay. <laughs> right, so this is a thing that I found on Reddit and there was an AMA from the author. It's basically web Photoshop. You can import Photoshop, uh, Corel and sketch files and any other basic, image formats and uh, then you can edit them. Like you can literally do just about, like not everything Photoshop does, but a lot of basic things that allow you to do right here in the web browser and it all works in your, you know, in, in the window essentially. There's, I, I, as far as I know, there is no backend code in there, which is kind of insane. And all of that is open source as well, so. Um, or okay, I'm lying, not all is open source. So he still haven't open sourced the complete thing, but the basically majority of the components in the website are open source by now. There's also a very interesting AMA on the Reddit. So do check it out if that sounds uh, interesting, but this is a really cool and fascinating tool. Okay, next thing we got is Pico Match, blazing fast and accurate globe matcher written in JavaScript uh, with no dependencies and full support for standard and extended bash globs with a bunch of features that you would expect from the Unix glob matching. So if you needed to match any Unix globs, then this seems to be the library to take. It has a ton of features and seems to be very tiny and fast. Next library we got is called FX, or is actually a command line JSON processing tool, not a library. And it's basically like JQ if you ever heard about it, but written in JavaScript. So you can actually do fun things like this and provide it with uh, arrow functions that would transform JavaScript for you, which is kind of awesome when you think about it. So the JQ is quite powerful as well, but the syntax is a bit wonky, while here you can literally just use JavaScript to transform any JSON you want, which is kind of awesome. So if you work a lot with the JSON from command line, do check this out, it looks quite nice. All right, next thing we got here is Bluestream a collection of streams that work well with promises through a uh, map re uh, the, pff, through map reduce methods think through two with promises so um i would actually compare this to the uh, highland js stream library but with less features and uh, i think i don't know this one's written in typescript i don't actually know what the highland js is written in but yeah if you're working it definitely has less features than uh, highland but it's probably also smaller so if you're working on streams and need a nice small library that would allow you to pipe map tap reduce and do things like this that also support promises and everything and you can await it then check it out this seems to be quite nice okay next thing we got here is glider js blazingly fast crazy small for responsive mobile friendly dependency free native scrolling with paging controls that was a long description. So this is essentially a nice carousel here. So there you go. It's it's a carousel, right, in JavaScript. And it's mobile friendly. And it's very tiny and fast. Uh, but that description was over the top anyway. <laughs> so yes, if you're looking for a mobile friendly carousel in um, JavaScript and very small one, then check this out. 
Okay, next thing we got here is test 262 or 262, I guess, reports. This is an official thing from uh, ECMAScript committee that uh, is gonna track the implementation of the JavaScript language features across the JavaScript engines. So on the left here, we see the four current JavaScript engines. We got the V8, Chakra Core, Spider Monkey, and JavaScript Core. And on the right, we can see the uh, things defined by JavaScript, uh, ECMAScript specification, like language syntax, standard built-in objects, internalization API, and additional features for browsers. And then we can see the percentages supported in each and every of those engines. I found it interesting that none of those engines actually support any of those categories 200%. The closest they get is 99% in the additional uh, features for web browsers. But nonetheless, having the official place that actually tracks the implementation of the spec is really, really cool. So if you are interested, then check it out. Okay, uh, next thing we got here is JS Linux project. Uh, it's been actually around for a while, but uh, they recently released the um, um, Risk v 64 in the browser. So not only can you now emulate 86 stuff, like, you know, we had the Linux, we had the Windows, and we had the FreeDOS, but you can now actually run the um, Risk v 64 Linux in your browser right here. And even with X Windows, it seems, which is insane when you think about that, but... Um, yeah, it sim seems to be working and it's kind of crazy. And um, yeah, it's pretty impressive nonetheless. Okay, um, last thing we got in the libraries and demos is actually the book. It's called The Road to GraphQL and it is absolutely free. So if you're interested in learning GraphQL, then do check this out. There is a lot of praise and comments and a lot of people are very happy about it. So do go and uh, look at it. And if you like it, support the author as usual. All right, that's it for the libraries and demos. Now we're coming to the interesting and silly things. And the first interesting thing we got today is the VirtualBox E1000 guest to host escape. Yes, someone found a vulnerability in VirtualBox that allows you to escape the guest VM, which is um, kind of terrifying and insane at the same time. There is a full write up right here in the readme. So if you're interested in this kind of stuff, do have a look. And this is also a reminder for people who claim that Docker is not secure, that VMs are also not that secure as well. And there is always gonna be ways to escape from them. So, you know, this is probably not the best arguments in favor of VMs against Docker. Okay, and the last thing we got is absolutely awesome. So someone compiled a list and there's actually author is mentioned below in the other tweet. Uh, compile the list of instances of AI doing what creators specify, not what the creators mean. Uh, here's an example. Neural nets evolved to classify edible and poisonous mushrooms, uh, mushrooms took advantage of the data being presented in alternating order and didn't actually learn any features of the input images. So um, yeah, take, take whatever you want from that. There's an even cooler uh, example over here. So the creatures bred for speed grow really tall and then generate high velocities by just falling over, which is absolutely freaking fascinating. So just, just think about it, right? So the, the boundaries were not specified correctly. So the creatures needed to be very fast or achieve high velocities, it seemed, right? So instead of actually evolving to achieve those velocities by running, they evolved to be really tall and then just started falling very fast, <laughs> which is just absolutely hilarious. And um, there is a whole Google Doc with this crap and it is hilarious. So highly recommended read. Yeah, so the researcher in uh, question, the author of the Google Doc is Victoria Krakovna, I guess. Uh, and uh, there are some amazing things in there. Um, Tetris, agent pauses the game indefinitely to avoid losing. You win in Tetris, this is like best AI. This is how I play video games. I just pause and leave and I never lose like this. <laughs> Um, yeah, this is basically all I got for today, guys. This is um, episode 36 in a nutshell. So if you have any questions, suggestions, or things you want to discuss, feel free to throw them into the chat right now. If not, as usual, you can find all the mentioned links on the GitHub. The link should be in the description. Um, feel free to send your things my way. I will be more than happy of um, talking to them, uh, pff, covering them is what I want to say. Uh, if not, then we can wrap this up. Okay, there are questions. 
What cost of GraphQL? I mean, the GraphQL, the cost of executing GraphQL is going to depend a lot of, uh, or based on what, what kind of data and what kind of backend you're using, right? But the with GraphQL, it's not the uh, question of uh, cost of the execution, but rather the question cost of developing the separate APIs. Like the, the core value proposition of GraphQL is that instead of writing hundreds of REST APIs, you can actually have one GraphQL endpoint and then just write different queries in the client, right? And you cannot really achieve that with any other technology. So uh, of course there's gonna be overhead in executing the queries that like, you know, translating GraphQL queries to Mongo or SQL or whatever, but that overhead is smaller compared to the, um, or it's not smaller, let's just put it, put it this way. It's easier to deal with rather than developing hundreds of REST endpoints, you can just scale your backend, right? So it's, it's way easier to do right now, especially if you take something like uh, backend as a service or maybe even GraphQL as a service, then you don't even have to think about scaling. So there you go. This is the general gist of it. Um, does, that, does that answer the question or should, should I explain a bit more? Because I mean, Yes, it does have a lot of overhead because you have to construct the sub queries from the GraphQL queries and it can be quite intensive, but then again, you know, so is forcing the developers to create 200 different endpoints just to query those tiny different slices of data. GraphQL is just efficient at that. All right, um, any more questions or things you guys wanna discuss? Maybe libraries that I have missed or if not, then we can just wrap this up here and go play video games, watch movies and do whatever the hell you want on this Saturday or maybe Sunday evening or Saturday evening, I don't know. I don't know what kind of time of the day you have out there where you're watching this stuff. <laughs> Why do you even watch me now? It's Saturday, go do something productive. All right, doesn't seem like we have any more questions or suggestions. 5 a.m., holy shit, why are you not sleeping? Go sleep. <laughs> why do you watch me at 5 a.m., man? Come on, you gotta go sleep. <laughs> okay, yeah, that sounds like a good time to wrap this up. <laughs> yes, productive or unproductive. Uh, that's, that's, that's a good question, it's Saturday, so do something unproductive. That's way better approach, that's true. Do something unproductive, like fall asleep, for example. That sounds like a good thing. Okay, guys, thank you very much for watching. Thank you very much for your support. Um, as usual, there's gonna be a lot more uh, development streams and PXJS streams and gaming streams and everything. So if you like what you saw, subscribe to this channel, uh, follow the YouTube and everything, come to our Discord chat and uh, talk to us about JavaScript and video games. Yeah, thank you for watching. Have an awesome rest of the weekend or the rest of the week if you're watching a video of this and I see you next time. Bye.